Philosophers. Philosophers. Well, David, what are we going to talk about today? Well, is it wrong to tell a lie? Hmm. Well, conventionally, from what you're taught as a child, yes. And we all have this kind of, you know, instinctual response to it, I would say that, you know, I think the gut response would be yes, but I've never given much thought as to why it's wrong to lie. So I, uh, I actually have thought about this quite a bit, and uh, depending on which angle you look at it from, you can get some different answers. Um, so Sam Harris wrote a book called Lying. You familiar with it? Yes, I am. I've actually uh, listened to it at your, uh, well, not at your request, but at your recommendation. Okay, so you're familiar with, with his statements about that, that his opinion is basically it doesn't matter whether it's wrong to lie, it's just generally a bad idea. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I want to go a little bit further and, uh, and see if the case can be made that at least in some cases... It's genuinely wrong to lie and not merely a bad idea. Okay. Well, in that case, let's uh, talk about what we're talking about. <clears throat> the second definition of the word lie, according to the Oxford, and this is, of course, skipping the, you know, let's lie down version of the word. A lie is an intentionally false statement. Um... And the verb to lie is to tell a lie or to tell lies. So, right. And a one one thing that some people don't uh, don't think about when discussing lying is that to, to lie is not merely to say something that's not true. It's to say something that you believe isn't true. Right. That's the whole point of the word intentionally being in the definition. Um, so. Now, I, I kind of want to open this up and expand a little bit because um, I want to make sure that we're you know, in the right scope of what we're really talking about. And uh, some people will use the term uh, lie by omission, for example. Do you think that a lie by omission is within the scope of what we're talking about today, or is that different? Um, I don't know if it will be relevant to, uh, to what I wanted to bring up today, but it... Um... It is relevant to a discussion about lying. I think that lying by omission is um, is a legitimate concept um, that, uh, you know, l intentionally leaving out crucial details of, say, a story or, more importantly, a testimony in a court um, can, have, uh, can, can have the same effect as overtly lying. Yeah. I guess when we get to talking about it more, we, we could dig into if it's the same thing or if it's something else. Um, so let's get into that. So to, in, to make an intentionally false statement, that's a really simple definition. It's a very simple concept. You believe that it is, more, it is, it is wrong. I don't think that it's always wrong. Uh, for instance, the, the classic extreme case of uh, you are harboring Jews during the Holocaust and uh, the Gestapo knocks on your door and uh, says, are you hiding any Jews? Um, the, the case can be made that the right thing to do is to lie to the Gestapo um, so to save the lives of those that you're, that you're harboring. Mm -hmm. um, and so... so and, you know, specifics can be argued, and maybe there is a, a better way to approach that situation than overtly lying to the Gestapo. But regardless, the, it really is a, uh, a philosophical proof of concept that there, is, there, there can be cases in which lying is the right thing to do over just telling the truth. Um, but, uh, so, so and the way that... Um, the way that Sam Harris put it in his book, I found very interesting, uh, is that the, the time to lie really would is when you would otherwise perhaps use a weapon, uh, which I found very interesting. Um, that that you know if you if you possess a weapon, 
you don't just go around using it on people. You only use it when you need to to protect yourself or somebody else. Um, and likewise with lies. You shouldn't go around lying to people, but if it means to protect yourself or others, then anything is on the table. Um, almost anything. Uh, th things that would are normally totally unacceptable and enter the uh, the realm of acceptable behavior. And uh, and lying is just another tool in your tool belt for dealing with a dangerous situation like that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it, d let's use that analogy. I guess it would be safe to say that in a perfect world, killing another person is always wrong. You know, and because in a perfect world, no one would threaten you and you would never need to use self-defense, for example. So, and then in the same world, lying would always be wrong because you wouldn't need to use it. Lying, much like weapons, are practical measures to try to help compensate against wrongdoers. Should yeah, be treated can, the same way? Yes, I, uh, I can get behind that. Uh, that that yes, in a in a perfect society, we can just declare lying wrong outright because there there should be no legitimate use for it. Okay, but we don't live in one, so let's let's get in, let's. I think it's useful sometimes to establish you know in the ideal world because then you can really get an understanding for you know because there are some things that would never but they wouldn't pass the ideal case, and if they don't pass the ideal case, I don't think they would pass the pragmatic case so I wanted to clear that up so let's go down to the pragmatic case now while we're in the pragmatic case we can say whether or not lying is generally wrong and should only be used in a scenario in which you have already been threatened or others have been threatened like lying is a type of recourse in this case it should never be condoned as an initiatory action same way with exercising your right to defend yourself like i should never draw my weapon to hurt another person to start something only as a reaction to someone else starting something right right um so something that just occurred to me is that uh, perhaps a, a distinction needs to be made on the part of those who are um playing a character um the uh, the the example that came to my mind uh, was the uh, the amusing case of um the i hesitate to call him a politician um vermin supreme you familiar with vermin supreme no i'm not oh goodness you need to see this uh we will uh, we will provide a link to uh, a fine display of, of vermin supreme uh basically he's this old guy um i uh, i forget which state that he's in but uh Every uh, every presidential election cycle, he runs for president. Uh, he's been I think he's been doing this since the 90s, um, and he he assumes a false character to do this, named Vermin Supreme, uh, as a as a parody of of politicians, and that, that's what he does. He, he's a parody act, um, and uh, he he says you know out, outrageous things, uh, and uh, basically uh, sa says. Um, his policies often have to do, or not his policies, but just the thing, the things that he says um, appear to be the thing that things that politicians actually mean, but are too afraid to tell you. Um, you know, like, don't worry, I know what's best for you. You know, that that kind of thing. Right. Um, so, so, so anyway, so in this particular case, you know, he's assuming an alias. Um, and running for public office under this alias, because he does actually enter the race. Um, of course, he, I don't think he ever makes it past uh, very, uh, you know, local steps, but, but regardless. Um, the point is that he's, objectively speaking, lying when he's doing this, but because it was for a purpose of, of illustrating something else, like his intent wasn't to deceive people, but to assume a role for some other purpose. Hmm. 
But now, this does kind of come into conflict with our established definition, however, for a lie. Because he is intentionally saying something that... Well, is it, though? Is he intentionally saying things that are false? Because the thing about parody is, you don't necessarily say things that are false. You say things that are perhaps ambiguous, that you don't know whether they're true or false, but it, it might be speaking to an absurdity, you know that isn't necessarily true or false. Like for example, when uh, oftentimes in political parody, someone will say something that may not be false. Um, but in it, there's this catch-22, um, to speak politely, I will call it the little penis defense um, that you see sometimes used in parody. I'll provide a link to context for that one. Um, but it happens a lot in writing where someone will, because the thing is, it, in order for it to be a lie, it has to be false, right? Well, how would you know it's false? Well, you have to prove that it's false. And oftentimes the only way to do that is to prove the truth. So if someone insults you by something embarrassing like that, well, when you uh, challenge it, you have to prove them wrong. And so you, in this, in the case, it's called the little penis or the, the defense because in order for someone to challenge you saying someone has a small manhood, you have to prove otherwise. And that's in, in the process of proving that person being false is more embarrassing than dealing with it uh, as a parody, for example. So uh, this is a little off track, but it's something similar where it's like, it's ambiguous and the confirmation would cause more pain than just letting it be ambiguous. So I don't know if it is a lie at that point, it's just an assertion or it's just a statement that hasn't been proven true or false. Right, I, I don't think that I would classify that as a lie because if someone doesn't actually know the, uh, to, to use the, the technical jargon, if someone doesn't actually know the truth value of a proposition, then they cannot lie about that proposition. Well, there's also a loophole there. What if I kept myself ignorant so that I could say whatever I wanted? You know, because that's, I mean, and there are people that I would argue use this strategy all the time in politics because we hold people who don't know to a different standard than those who do know and say something falsely. Yes, this brings with it the, the discussion of willful ignorance, um, which has its own whole set of problems as well. Um, I, I think that the case could be made that willful ignorance is, uh, is wrong in its own right, um, but you know, regardless, something something said as a result of willful ignorance is not a lie, but it could be wrong for its own reason that's, that has nothing to do with the fact that it's not a lie. Mm. Well, for the sake of today, I say we table the willful ignorance argument for now, because I think that's another good one to have at some point, um, because that's something you and I have starkly different beliefs on when it comes to willful ignorance, so that'd be a good discussion for another time. So I guess back to our topic. Um, I think I think you're good with setting parodies up as different. Um, there might be some nuance there that I don't know that it's necessarily uh, worth going into at the moment. But I think when we, it's good to bring it up so that we can clarify that that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the case where a person, if you can know what they know, knows something is false and says it anyway as though it were true. Right. I think I think the distinction that I'm trying to draw here is that it not only matters uh, what the person believes about what they're saying, uh, but also there has to be an intent to deceive. Mm -hmm. Okay. See, that's that's where now, I'm going to start now, taking whether issue. or not whether or not that can be proven or not is beside the point, in my opinion. Mm, um, but okay. I, I think well well. Because we don't we don't take you know uh, let's say comedians who make up a story for sake of humor we don't call them liars we call them comedians and it's fine uh, we don't we don't condemn them for this because they're not trying to deceive anyone they're just trying to get a laugh right and I guess that's where I begin to take issue is because oftentimes well all the time. Intent is almost impossible to prove because you can't know what someone's thinking. And while you can get close enough right now, because there are like, for example, we have plenty of crimes where 
the intention can drastically change the punishment if they can prove it. Um, well, and, and even in the justice system, if I'm not wrong, and I'm ill-equipped really to speak to the technical level of it, but intent is something that ha that the police try to prove when they're investigating a crime. You know, they have to look for a motive, an intent, and a uh, and there's a couple of other things that aren't important for our purposes right now. But in the good gold case of murder, you know, the difference between first degree and second degree murder, first degree being worst, is it's premeditated, which means you had intentions to kill somebody that you thought out and you were sure about what you were doing, and that's what you have to prove to get the first degree murder charge, whereas the second degree murder charge is sometimes referred to as the crime of passion murder, which is where you commit murder not because you intended to in a rational way, but you did it anyway, and it's usually not premeditated. And then the third right. degree... Something, something happens where you're just suddenly enraged uh, into, a, into a violent episode and kill somebody. Exactly. It's, it's, it's almost like using an insanity defense, but it's not the same because it's what we would consider to be reasonable insanity, I suppose. And then the case of third degree murder, or manslaughter, as it's referred to commonly, uh, and there's varying degrees of this, but in general, a manslaughter case is where you had no intentions of murdering someone, but you did. For example, if you were driving along 65 on a highway, which is the speed limit, so you're not exceeding the speed limit, you're not being reckless, but a person runs out in front of you and there's no way you can stop and you hit them and kill them. That's not the same. Like, you did not intend in any way to kill that person, but you did it anyway. And that has a much lower sentence uh, than the other two. And it's, we don't even go so far as to call it murder. I mean, even though manslaughter is still an ugly phrase, it's different. Um, but the thing about intent is, and I, I haven't given it enough thought to know why, really. So I guess we'll have to figure it out now. I don't like intent. I don't think intent should matter, ever. Because it can't be known. And while we can maybe hypothesize and philosophize about why it's important, practically speaking, because you see, that's another problem, is we've stepped out of the ideal realm into the pragmatic realm. And in the pragmatic realm, you cannot prove intent empirically or scientifically or at the very least, not right now, okay? Um, so, I don't think it should ever be able to be called in as evidence, and I don't think that it's appropriate for other people to try to assume or prove another person's intentions. Because it's impossible to know for an outside agent, you know. You can't assume to know with I would argue any degree of accuracy, really, my intentions at any given time, you know. And certainly the closer towards, the closer we move towards an action I take, it might get somewhat easier to infer that intention, but intentions can be incredibly nuanced. And it's in that nuance that you lose the ability to adequately, in my opinion, determine intent, you know. Um, so... I acknowledge that um, that bringing intent into a definition gets messy in a hurry, um, especially when we, you know, because because we can we can talk about whether in principle it's wrong to lie, but regardless of our answer, when it comes down to actually condemning people for it, we have to use only what pragmatic tools are available to us. And uh, proving intent, as you've already said, uh, is uh, is very difficult, if not impossible. Right. Um, so, do you have an alternate definition to propose that captures the distinction that I've laid out that would otherwise be captured by an intent in the definition? Hmm. I don't think so at this moment. Let me give them. I could give it some thought. See, the thing about the definition is, it, the def there's actually nothing wrong with the definition on a singular individual scale. The only problem with the definition is that if you can't assume to know, the only person that knows they're lying or that can ever prove that they were lying is the person who lied. And there come some complications with that because typically if you're a liar, we don't trust you to tell that you were lying. And it's too easy for bias to fall into that as well. 
Now, um, you know, it's hard because my solution for circumventing uh, intentions is to, in a way, almost criminalize ignorance. Because if you assume all people to be not ignorant, then their attentions become irrelevant. If you speak a false truth, then it's a lie. So to remove the intention from the definition, a lie is just a false statement. Now, I'm prepared to go through the brain damage that I will acknowledge exists for that as well. And on the onset, before giving it too much thought, I would tend to say that there is less brain damage to be done there than there is to be done trying to deal with intention. So, I don't know that for a fact, however, and but I will tentatively hold the position for the sake of argument. Fair enough? Sure. Okay, so for the sake of argument, I will say that, well, instead of trying to use intention as a method to criminalize something, why don't we just criminalize ignorance and see where that takes us. Now, the obvious problem with this is, well, how do you prove someone's ignorant about something? Well, I think a, a different problem that doesn't even necessarily immediately reach into the pragmatic realm is how can you hold somebody at fault for being ignorant when, when it's not willful ignorance? Um, one doesn't have control over that about which they're ignorant. Well, at the risk of appealing to nature, um, I'm going to make the argument anyway. Um, ignorance is not... If you are ignorant about something in the state of nature, whereas, like, I am ignorant to the fact that a snake is venomous and bites me, for example, I will still suffer the consequences of being bit by the snake, regardless of whether I knew about it or not. And it's... And when you look at that as happening... You know, you can say it's the snake's fault, but the snake's not an agent, I would argue, so it can't be its fault. The only person's fault it is is your own for being bitten, if you could have prevented it. An even better example that takes any other living thing out of it is if you are ignorant that you built your house in a floodplain and then it floods, you are, in nature, in a roundabout way, responsible for the fact that your house was flooded. You know, and that's taking other agents out of the equation altogether. And so I find there might be some parity there with if in other, in, in cases in which you're not dealing with another agent, your ignorance is never an excuse. Why should it be an excuse when you're dealing with agents as well? I guess would be my retort. I think that um, it, it depends. Okay. Um, so like, for instance, if, uh, if some doctor wants to do some medical experiments and uh, he, he doesn't, you know, really know how it's going to turn out, um, you know, but, but he, he's fairly confident that, what he, that his, his experimental treatment will work. But, you know, of course, it has to be put to the test and he kills somebody with this treatment. He poisons them and they die. It's his fault. Yes. Um, I would argue that that is absolutely his fault. Yes. Uh, so so yes, I, I do agree that uh, that we can we can place blame there, um, because even though he was confident in his experiment, he still knew that he was putting people at risk. Sure. Um, but is that a problem? Is that a problem? Like for instance, if the test, uh, if the person being tested on was aware of the risk and accepted it anyway, it's no longer just the doctor's fault. Right. So at that point, you know, they're both to some extent, quote unquote, at fault, but I don't know if I would place blame on anyone, if that well, makes sense. Well, exactly. Because I think there's a, I mean, we'd have to get into the difference between fault and blame, but... In a scenario in which two people agree to something, and if it's above board and the ignorance is stated as such, where it's like, look, I don't know this for sure, but this is what I think. And that wouldn't be a lie, technically. That's actually the truth. Um, 
the doctor would say, look, I don't know that this is going to happen, but this is what I think is going to happen. If the person who is being experimented on, the test subject, use their own judgment to say, you know what, I, I, I'm aware of the con possible consequences, I accept anyway. A crime hasn't been committed in that case, because the, both parties agreed in advance. Now that's the perfect case. Now the imperfect case is the doctor doesn't consider that death could be a problem. Like death should not result from this at all, and tells the subject this. And so the subject aware that, well, I won't die. There might be other bad things, but I won't die if, you know, so I'm going to do this anyway. And then he dies. Is it a problem? Yes. Right. Now, the doctor spoke from ignorance. Can he claim that ignorance is a defense? If he really didn't believe that there was any way that person could have died, can he use that as a defense? I don't think so, uh, because he did still assert to the subject that they were not at risk of death. Yes. Um, so I, I think I think then, hmm, that, that is interesting because he didn't lie technically because he didn't intentionally say something false. The problem is that he couldn't have known the truth. So if he can't know what's true, he can't know what's false, and he's speaking from ignorance. And he can't, it, it, under the current logic that's laid out, he shouldn't be responsible. He couldn't have known. But at the same time, that doesn't sit well with us because people would say, well, he should have known. Or he should have been more careful. And, and I think the most important thing, too, since we're in the pragmatic sense, is what do you do now with that doctor? And we talked about justice before, but when you, when you really think about it, the encouragement should be that people should be as sure as possible, or at the very least, open about their uncertainty, because that's all, that covers your liability in this case. If the doctor would have disclosed that he didn't know and was open about his potential dishonesty by saying something that he couldn't prove, then he's covered. And so what when I'm when I look at charging ignorance as, you know, that's potentially criminalizing in that way, you I think could achieve a better outcome through even events in which a person commits a crime under ignorance because it promotes and encourages people to not be ignorant when it's not an excuse. And and there is, of course, always going to be the element of, well, but do you still hold them to the same level of responsibility to someone who acted, you know, out of an ill intent, which you can't even know, you know, because you can't know what the doctor knew or what didn't knew. Like, you can get pretty close. Like, if the doctor's written about the dangers of this and then said it verbatim otherwise to the doctor, well, contradicting yourself is a lie. Well, you know... The thing is, the thing is that we have this intuitive notion that uh, it, it's it's just intuitively worse to intentionally poison somebody and kill them than it is to attempt to save them and accidentally kill them. Sure, that's correct, but it's because intentions are something we all have. The problem is when we project what we would consider to be bad intentions on another person out of ignorance as well. It's I think when we begin doing that, we actually forward the problem because we're doing the same thing in a way by projecting intentions onto a person that we can't prove, but we just know it's right. Just like that person, you know, we can't, they could say, well, I just, I, I was sure that it wasn't gonna kill this guy. Well, I can say, well, I'm sure that you did know. Well, that's not getting us anywhere. To use that as a defense is to commit the same crime as the original offender, in my opinion. And one thing, one thing I think that's a lot easier is it's, it's, it's a lot easier to prove whether or not someone was ignorant than it is to improve someone's intentions. Because, for example, I brought up contradictions earlier. If you spoke one thing and you claim to know it and then you spoke differently, and that's on record, contradictions are a lot easier to lock down as proof. And that's and you'll see that happen in courts all the time. You know, when people get put on the stand, the, the goal of most attorneys is to get the witness to contradict themselves if they're not a favorable witness. Because once they've contradicted themselves, that's the clearest and easiest proof that someone can't be trusted, is that, well, 
They said this, and then five minutes later, they said the opposite. Well, which is true? And whichever one they say is true, they say, oh, well, the first one was true. Well, then you lied about the second one. Oh, I mean, the second one was true then. Well, then you lied about the first one. Either way, you're a liar, you know, by process of elimination. So we can't trust anything you've said, and it all gets thrown out. That's a very common tactic used by lawyers, um, or at least in the pop sense for sure, but I'm sure that it happens in real life court scenarios as well. Now you can, that's, but you're not proving necessarily that the person was intending to lie in that case, because you're not proving their intentions, you're proving their ignorance. And that I think is, might, might be a better way to do it. Now, do you have anything to say to that before I move on to, because I'm going to use the same scenario, but I'm going to change another variable. Go ahead. Okay. So in the same scenario, you have the doctor who's performing an experiment and you have the test subject. Now in this scenario, the doctor knows that it's very dangerous. And he knows that death is something that could likely occur. But he communicates to the test subject that it shouldn't happen. So he lies. And you can and say that he, this doctor is meticulous at keeping notes. And you can prove it. He lies to the patient. Then the patient dies. And during the process of bringing him to justice, they discover that. Oh, well, here's a piece of paper that you gave the test subject saying you shouldn't die from this. And then here is your notes from a week earlier saying that it's very likely the test subject will die from this. You then can't use ignorance as a defense, but it's the same outcome. You know, you still killed a person, but this is worse. So this, you can actually prove a lie by proving someone spoke out of not ignorance, but out of the no instead. So they're both bad. And and I do think that there's going to always be a human element in discerning justice because you can't, I don't think, ever perfectly account for every possible situation. But erring on the side of ignorance is bad and ignorance isn't an excuse. And in going even further and saying that if you acted out of ignorance, you are almost as bad as someone who acted knowingly in this case, I think is better. Now we're getting a little farther down the road on ignorance, but I, I don't, I don't, because you can presume, you don't have to presume that. You, you can prove that a little easier, I think. And it's, and the intentions in this case are entirely agnostic. You don't need to know his intentions. You know, you can infer them all you want, but the fact of the matter is, and you can prove that this person acted in a way that they knew was wrong or that they knew was misleading and you can prove it. And now this, I guess the next thing is, does this help you out if you just stay ignorant, for example? Well, no, because now ignorance isn't a haven for you to hide under and saying, well, I didn't know no better. You know, it's just as bad. You know, you still committed the same crime. You're still going to be held accountable for the same crime. Now, your punishment might be slightly differently, but if they're held to a very similar candle... I think it would encourage people to act a lot more carefully, personally. And then, and in that scenario, intention is never mentioned and we don't need to know. So you can take the intentions out of lying and it still be a lie. You know, it's, it's it, not by definition, but you would get the same. You, you could, I think, achieve a better outcome, if not the same outcome, by pursuing it that way. So. Let's talk about a different kind of lie. Okay, that's fine. Defamation. Okay. Define it, or would you like me to define it? Go ahead. Defamation. The act of damaging the good reputation of someone, slander, or libel. And I do believe slander or libel are both forms of defamation. Slander is spoken defamation, whereas libel is written defamation, or typed, or whatever. Right. That's why I use the uh, the generic term because, or the 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 more general term, because I don't think that it matters for purposes of this discussion. So, defamation, I think, is a uh, is a special type of lie, um, because it it also seems, you know, it it seems tied a little bit with intentions as well mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to be no um but um but but i think i think defamation is one of those cases uh in which which i think um that that lying is wrong uh that that you're be, because normally 
a case of defamation is um, is attempting to uh, to destroy the reputation of somebody else to achieve some other aim. Well, that's true. I'm going to be technical. I'm going to pull a technical card and say that defamation has nothing to do whether or not it's a lie. Defamation, I would argue, can even be a good thing. Potentially. For example, if you had a good reputation and I did business with you and you cheated me and I could prove it, I could publish that proof to the public and that is technically defamation because it it's tarnishing your currently good reputation. But it's true. Um, but for the sake of argument, I will accept uh, your I, I will accept your modified version of defamation to say defamation as a result of a lie, or writing right. defamation, so, such as you know what we prosecute for in slander and libel cases. Right, because defamation in a legal sense is slightly different. Because uh, defamation in a legal sense, for example, when I was speaking earlier, um, in order for you to prove that it is slander or libel, you had to prove that it's false first then you have to prove the intentions that they were trying to hurt your good name. If you can get both, then you can nail them to the wall for the crime of slander or libel. So, okay, well, let's take an example out of this case. Why does defamation damage your reputation? How does that work? How can just me damage your reputation? Uh, so, perhaps by uh, uh, spreading some false rumor about me, um, that uh, you know, through through quirks of human psychology, people believe, even though they don't have a good reason to, um, which I find also very interesting. That, that because that, that's that's really what makes uh, what makes defamation so what what makes something like slander so damaging is that um, it's not merely the fact that you said something false; it's that people so readily believe it. That it has lasting implications. That that even say even if I could prove that you slandered me, let's say, um, and 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 could prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that everything you said about me was wrong, my reputation would still be permanently damaged uh, because there would be people who would continue to believe the lie. See, I would argue that it's not the person who said the false thing that damages your reputation, however. I would argue that it's all those that believe it that damaged your reputation. And it's not so much that... Because reputation, in all metaphysical sense, is irrelevant. It's what that reputation can be used for that's relevant. Like, for, ins for example, your reputation when you go to get a job is only even important when you have one. And it has a markable effect on whether or not you get the job, for example. So, your perceived, the way your reputation is perceived is what's really important. And that's, that changes with each individual. Because your reputation is not a static thing. It's all, it's, it's, an, it's, almost, like a nego, it's almost like a tacit negotiation between your persona and another's, and another person, you know. Um, now, it's the person who, like, give me, like, let's stick with that example. I defame you, and then you go apply for a job, and, the, and there's one person in the interview, and he has heard my defaming, and he chooses to believe me and doesn't hire you. Who committed the real crime? Whose fault is it that you didn't get the job as a result of the defamation and all? It's hard, it's hard to point to one of them but between Why? you and the interviewer. Well, okay. So, uh, I'll, so, slight tangent. Okay. Sure. Okay, I'll accept your tangent. Um, a uh, a murderer shoots somebody and kills them. Okay. But it wasn't it wasn't the the person who killed them, or even the gun, or even the bullet. It was the blood loss, and you know we can we can you know. But you see where I'm going with this. Yeah, that, I see that, where you're going with this. Basically, that it. It matters who set off the chain of events that caused this to happen. Right, but if we're going to go there, then, oh boy, we need to start going back in history to find the first person who did the wrong thing that set all of us down this chain of events, which, I mean, if you ask a religious person, well, it's the devil, of course, <laughs> but we don't live in that world. I would argue that it's not the person that defamed you's fault. It's the person who believed it and then chose not to hire you because he's the person who had all of the power over whether or not to hire you, and he made the choice. 
And I even think that you should be able to sue him for not hiring you on the basis of something that is false, for example, if you go that far. Because if I didn't, then it's logically inconsistent. I'd have to defend that point. And I'm willing to die on that hill if I have to. But I'll take this back to, I think that I can bring in my example of ignorance here as well. For in order for him to believe this defamation, he has to accept it out of nothing other than what I've said and my word and any air quotes evidence that I have, right? Now, keeping in mind that we are talking about false defamation here, not true defamation. Um, so if I have air quotes evidence for false defamation and he looks over the evidence and judges it to be true, he's wrong, A, and he's acting out of ignorance, or he's acting out of ignorance. Both are wrong. So the actions he takes as a result of that regarding you are also wrong. It's his fault he's ignorant, and he and he should suffer for it. And don't get me wrong, I think in a market-style society, he would suffer for it, because if you really did, if you deserved a good reputation because you were a good employee, and I defamed you by saying something about your work ethic, he's going to lose out for not hiring you anyway he's punished by market forces in that in that way and the person who looks at that and sees it for what it is or chooses to disregard information that they can't be sure about and treats everything they hear as false unless otherwise proven to be true then you're good to go like i think and, and if you treat it that way legally and we treat it that way socially which acknowledging human psychology aside because that's a good point um you could achieve a better society, I think, if 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 we were able to look at things in the context of ignorance is bad, even going so far to say it's immoral to use ignorance when making choices about another person. That's a lot, that's a different thing, it's a bigger thing, but I'm just going to stay, I'm, I'm not going to go there at the moment. But in a world where we all had to have proof for everything that we if we had to have proof to operate off of making bigger decisions and i think that's where it would actually show more because you know in your small decisions every day that don't affect other people in a large way it's kind of less relevant because who cares as long as it's not potentially hurting anybody else it's fine but in big decisions, if you're operating on a basis of ignorance, you should suffer for it. And I think people do suffer for it. And I think that's a lot closer to the truth of the situation, is operating and looking at it from the framework of ignorance instead of the framework of intentional wrongdoing. And not only that, but the person, people who, well, people defame others for a reason. You know, I think that's another thing we need to consider. Why do people lie? You know, why do people defame? You know, and I think if you don't have anything else to say about my examples on ignorance as a good substitute here as well, I, we, I'd like to go down that road as well. But I mean, I'm not going to skip off and jump on this unless you want to talk more about it. Um, hmm. I'm not convinced. Let's put it that way. I still think that looking at it from the framework of ignorance and that it is the sole fault of the person who believes the... For the context of you not getting the job, it's the sole fault of the person who had the choice to hire you or not for using bad information or false information or even ignorance in making his choice. That's his fault, and he should suffer for it, and he will, you know. I think he would buy the market. I don't think you have to bring in another person to lay out, lay down justice on that person. It's going to happen anyway, so... That's, that's what I, I think is much better, and a lot closer to the truth of the situation. I think that... I don't know. Um, I, I think you're right. Um, but I, I can think of you know, very, very specific cases in which you know, that, that may not happen. Like, let, let's take the case of a, uh, the defamation of, say, a very famous actor. Okay. Um, a a uh, false accusation is made, which is seen as you know obscene in the eyes of the public, and now even even though there is there is you know no evidence backing this uh, this accusation, uh, the 
a a large let's let's say a large enough segment of the public continues to believe it to the point where now anyone who hires this actor and casts them um will will similarly suffer a hit to their reputation so they get um, ostracized so, right and so so now nobody who is trying to cast a film wants to hire this actor because they fear for their own reputation even sure. even if they don't believe the lie yeah it's still their fault and and no I, I agree it's still their fault for for not hiring him but but I I guess, I guess I'm trying to I'm trying to get back to the root here which is was it wrong to defame that person because now there there is a there's a measurable effect on their life that that this this hypothetical false accusation has now ended their career you know i would my confidence levels being what they are would say it's neutral it's not positive nor negative because i don't know and to be honest my gut feeling would you know is obviously yeah it's wrong for you to do that because you're wanting to hurt somebody but in the world where you can't prove it you can't ever know it's beyond the scope of knowability and so it's irrelevant you know in that way and I take issue with inferring wrongness from feeling or intuition, which is what you'd have to do. Um, and the nuance of this situation aside, because in this situation it's especially potent because the person's worth is publicly decided by popularity. So it is, it's the worst case scenario where, you know, because the same thing could happen to a uh, concrete company owner. But people don't give a crap about, you know, he's not in business because he's popular. He's in business because people need concrete, you know. And I would say that, you know, I, I would say that it's a, uh, it's neutral or it's agnostic. You can't know in the case of, is it, is it wrong? But I'll see your situation and raise you the situation. Because I think this is what's going to happen, and I think we're getting there really soon. Because I think that as rhetoric, especially as it takes place now, is getting as ratcheted up as it is, you'll reach a point where, and I think that it's surprising that we haven't gotten here yet, the society in which I'm talking about where we don't care, and you take everything as false immediately before you even, you hear it and you assume it's false and you have proof otherwise, that's a result of people doing this. Because if, you, if people go unpunished, because I don't think you can actually punish them for this, logically, what's to keep everyone from doing it? And what will happen is the society will change to compensate for it. Because in that situation, okay, so you get defamed. Well, what's to keep someone else from defaming the person that defamed you? And then the, someone else, it's the chain of defamation. And before you know it, it's the public get so bogged down with is there even a good person out there or okay this can't all be true and you start doubting everything i think that's just the natural result once you stop trying to force by law and by you know public decision no this was the true thing and this was the false thing and we're going to assume that's the truth because we just know it if you stop doing that and just let it run its course. Yes, there's going to be a dark time where people have to figure out the hard way that people lie and defame and will stop relying on people, which I think is a bad thing anyway. You can't rely on other human beings for crap because they don't tell the truth even when they want to sometimes. And I think there will be a, and in the marketplace of ideas you'll reach a point where the a better solution will rise to the forefront one based on evidence and when we move to that type of society we're much better off i think what's holding that up right now is a quirk of human psychology which i think that you'd have to agree that human psychology is flawed 
and it doesn't react to nature in a way that always aligns itself with what might be true. And I think in order for us as a species or as a societies move forward, we're going to have to overcome those quirks, which we've reinforced socially by saying, by lying, by laying out false, and when I say false, I mean not in concurrence with the true truth of reality, definitions of words like lying and defamation, because they don't actually represent something that I think really happens in a way that you can prove. So on my gut feeling, I'll say, yeah, it's wrong for a person to do that, but you can't prove it. You can't prove that it's wrong. I'll say it's unprovable that it's wrong. Um, you might, through some utilitarian way, be able to, to prove that it's wrong, which I think you'd have to do. But on a purely metaphysical level, you can't prove it's wrong. Well, on a purely metaphysical level, you can't prove anything's wrong. Exactly. But you, but I think that, well, not on a purely metaphysical level in any way. I don't think you can prove that it was morally wrong, you know, because it, it and you get back to this place where it's not just the person who said the thing, who actually committed defamation. It's back on all the people who decided that, yeah, you know what, I'm going to believe that with no evidence. They are all just as wrong. And when you spread the crime out that thin... You can't go arrest all the people that did the wrong thing. You can't lay the blame at all of their feet. And you just can't. And so you need to, I think, let this... I hate saying this because it sounds such, you know, it sounds utopiast, but you just got to let it fall to pieces first and then let society change to a method that is a lot better. I think the reason it's it, it, it keeps happening is because we keep reinforcing the system that allows this to exist because our system as it exists our societies as they are now allow for these things to exist because we reinforce that behavior and it, we have no reason not to until you're all of a sudden you're the person at the other end of a defamation and then it's like well I, that sucks <laughs> you know and no one will help you because we all don't want to be that person and it's always easier, and it, I think you could even say there's tribal, tribalistic elements involved here too. You know, I think there's some there's a sadistic uh, human element to that, where it's like, oh, it's not me, at least, getting defamed. And as long as it's someone else being defamed, it won't be me. So let's defame that person, and it won't be me, you know. I don't think that's, you'll see any other reason, you know, it's in the in-group, out-group thing. Like, that's why you'll see people flip on other people. Like, you know, you'll see people who have known each other for a long time and that know that defamation is false flip on other persons under social pressure because they don't want to belong to the out-group, you know. And uh, I know I'm not really addressing your question. I'm beating around the bush, and that's because I can't answer it. I don't think you can prove that it's wrong. And I don't think that I can prove that it's right. I just think that it's a bad definition. And it's a bad way to define what's happening because it doesn't fit with what the reality of the situation is. And humans are irrational. I'll give you that to a degree. But I think that's the problem is that it's a human psychology problem that if we keep addressing in this way is only going to lead to its repetition. I think we need to change the frame. You know, because if, if you can't prove it's right and you can't prove it's wrong, you might be in the wrong frame. You know, might try moving frames first. And that's what I would advocate is let's change the frame from being intentions to ignorance. Because ignorance is easier. And, he, and I'm not saying ignorance is the way to go. And it's going to be the end all be all. I think it's just the next step because it's close enough that people can accept it until we find something better. You know, but that's what I would say. But I can't address, I, I can't tell you that you're wrong. I just don't, I can't tell you that it is wrong, but I can say that I think the way we deal with it is wrong. And I, I would move the goalpost there. I'm, I'm fine with doing that because I'll concede to the point that I can't tell you that it's actually wrong. Or actually right, I should say. Because you're the one saying that it is wrong. Or So, I don't know. That, that's, that's where I'm at on it. You know. Um... Interesting. Yeah. Now, um, I, 
I don't know where you go with that, like, from there. I, I think it's going to have to be one of those things where you'd have to see, you know. And I'd like to talk more about substitutions on ig substituting ignorance. I think that needs to be its own thing, because there are, I'm sure, flaws with that idea that I've yet to conceive that I'd like to work out as well. But I'm going to leave that there. Um, hmm. We brought up something a minute ago. I was going to go on a tangent and we came back to this, which I'm glad we did, but I can't remember what my tangent was going to be. So that's defamation. Are there any other kinds of lying you want to address? <laughs> or are other those the two main kinds ones? of lying. Um, no, not really. Because one of the other kinds of lying, I guess we've already kind of talked about, is if you drop the ignorance, if you drop the intentions, it's lying out of ignorance, you know. Um, but even then, that's not really lying about what you're talking about. It's lying about, it's lying by pretending to be confident when you're not, you know, or lying by pretending to have information that you don't. So it's kind of the same thing. Because that, that's something as well. It's sort of like lying in the subtext. Um, mm. That, uh... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> More intentions and interpretation. Sure, yes, but you know, because you know there, there's, I don't know, yeah, there, there is something about the confidence with with which something is said that is that is used to determine whether somebody, well, I, no, not not used to determine whether somebody is lying, but um, that. That makes us want to hold somebody... That might make the difference between us holding somebody at blame for something or not. Yeah. But that's even harder to deal with in any system. Because when well, we're talking about subtext, you know... That I love the example that George... Uh, not Jordan Peterson. God. Sam Harris. Sam Harris gives in his, uh, in his book where he's, when he talks about subtext. You know, when your wife asks you, do I look fat in this dress? Or does my butt look big? Or something like that effect. The, the answer is, of course, no. Right, and it's because the subtext of that question isn't the question, it's do you love me, or do I look good, or do you find me attractive? And you, being a member of the relationship, are privy to that context, which provides the subtext. So you know what the question is, and it's not a lie for you to say. Because even if... No matter how fat she actually looks in the dress. Right, you know, that's not the real question to be addressed. And that's nuanced. That's super nuanced, and that's where it gets down to... You know, I'm fine with it being that nuanced because then it comes down to being a debate between those two people over what the subtext might be if there even is a debate to be had at all. And that doesn't affect people in the broader scope either. You know, not generally. You know, it's not going to affect anyone outside the two, which is where I like it, keeping it between the two people. You know, I think in an ideal world, you know, we, we, we could actually boil every dispute down to the two proponents of it, uh, and it would be great. And that's a good example where no one, no third party could come in and offer any better perspective than the two that are already privy to it. You know, because it, there might be some that are in a relationship where that subtext doesn't exist or it's different, you know, and you can't presume to know. And I'm okay with that. I like that. But it's, it's good. I, I would definitely recommend, uh, it's a short book. Actually, I listened to it on audio uh, as an audio book, and it only took me like 45 minutes or an hour to go through it. It's a very short book, yeah. It's very worthwhile as well. Um, and while I think he... And, and the, the intention isn't to say whether lying is right or wrong. He, he never says that. He just says it's a bad idea. And I think that's a really good way to approach it. And I would agree. I think lying is a bad idea from personal experience, but I won't say that it's wrong. But... Um, I think on the societal level, when you start looking at it, I think it should just be allowed to happen. You know, to go all the way back to your um, uh, firearms example, there, there's a distinction that needs to be made here where defamation does not hurt somebody directly. Like, if I spoke the defamation to you, it's not going to hurt you. If I'm trying to defame you to you, it's not going to hurt you. If I pull a firearm out and shoot you, it's going to hurt you physically. Defamation or lying, if anything else, is in the realm of influence, you know. And that's different. And there are other parties that need to be involved. 
And I guess the best analogy for defamation would be like me pulling out a gun and pointing it at someone else, but not shooting them. And then making a statement and telling them to do something else to go hurt somebody else or commit another crime. You know, that's almost the same, but it's slightly different because we have a word for that when it's just words and it's coercion or extortion. Um, that's different. But I don't. I don't know. I, as the more I think about it, I actually don't like the, defi- the. I don't like the example of the firearm versus the words because they are, I think, fundamentally different. I don't know. I don't oh, yeah? know if they're fundamentally different. Oh yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. At a at a micro level, yes, they are. Obviously, you know, the projectile doesn't have any will of its own. It's going to go where it's going, and what happens happens, right? Yeah, but whereas a person, in principle, has the ability to think critically and uh, and and decide what to believe, but on a macro scale, the case can be made that once once you know a, a statement is made, uh, you know that which which you know would have these defaming effects people are going to do what they're going to do um and it's it's just a it's a reality of psychology which which you know is is just a a physical property of of humans um that it will turn out that way hmm. and so and so you know just like we hold someone at fault for shooting somebody because you know they didn't they didn't actually rip that person's body tissue apart they just pushed a switch you know pulled the trigger with right. the knowledge that probably in the, except in the case of a malfunction you know with the knowledge that probably you know they would launch a projectile into them and and damage their body tissue and kill them and so the same like, likewise with defamation you know someone says something with the knowledge that probably enough people are going to believe it so as to ruin this person's life. Well, let me raise your situation again, because I think there's an interesting... uh, Let's go back to what we talked about with taboos, okay? Because we're talking about words and all. Say that I was privy to the information that there is an asteroid heading straight for Earth that was going to blow it up in one year, and there's nothing we can do to stop it. Like, I know for a fact there's nothing we can do to stop it. We cannot muster the resources to stop this thing. It's too big. Or a supernova, even better. You can't stop energy from traveling through space to... Or a GRB, you know. Gamma ray burst. Something... A cosmological event that you cannot stop and it will will annihilate all life on Earth. Now, humans being humans and societies being societies, what do you think would happen if I proved it to the public? And it's true. And I say it. Panic hysteria. Sure. Yep. Now, am I wrong for saying it? Because it's having, it has a worse effect than if I lied and couldn't prove it. Or it has a worse effect than the lying by defamation. And I didn't control the actions of any of those people. It could be true and still be hurtful. But is it still wrong for me to say it? And, and I'm, I'm a rational human being. I know what societies are going to do if I say that. Is it still wrong for me to say it? Because that's really, I think, the difference is it's not so much whether or not it's true or whether or not it's false. It's do I have a good enough, would a reasonable person know what effect that would have on society and am I responsible for the effect that it has, you know? And you could, I think, make a case under that logic that, yeah, you shouldn't say it. Because then you're responsible for all the, you know, chaos and havoc that'll be ripped upon the world, you know. You should just shut up and let the world die a year from now and live your life normally. You know. I think you can make that case under that previous existing logic. Whereas I don't think you should hold the person responsible for publishing that information. But it's the same thing. You know, it's, it's, it's knowing, it's, it's, that, it's that system of assuming an outcome and acting under that assumption and then being responsible for the result if it happens the way that you assumed it would. 
Like for example, is it defamation if I try to defame you and it's horribly awful and no one believes me? Is it still defamation? Or would you treat it the same way? I think I would. Sure you would, but would it matter as much practically? Because your reputation doesn't get destroyed. So it's not defamation, it's just a lie. It's just a bad lie. That no one believes. Well, no, but, you know, likewise with my with my uh, poor, poorly conceived firearm example, if you, you know, if, if you shoot somebody with the intention of killing them, but it doesn't kill them, you still tried to. It's still wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, w when it comes to the case of proving you were trying to, that's you know that's something totally different. But you know the th the point is that you still did something wrong, even if you know. L let's say they had very rapid recovery and it didn't even interfere with their their life at all, aside from the psychological trauma of being shot. Oh, even yeah, but it's, say you nick their, you miss. Sure, even. Okay, but see, this this is where I'm thinking that we're in a bad frame. Because if I change the scenario where it's not a lie, and it's only, if I isolate the fact that it's only how people will react to the information, for example, it's not bad. I agree. But if I change it to and isolate that, oh, it's the only the thing that I said, you know, you still say it's bad, but I say it's innocuous, you know. It's the effect that makes it bad, and practically speaking. But even then, you know, I, I you know, because... Well, it's the effect that makes anything bad in a pragmatic sense. Sure, that, and that's the point. But, like, it's, it's, but the effect isn't in this case, to, it's, you can sure linkage it back to an individual, but the practical damage is not coming from that individual. It's coming from every person who chooses to act on that information. And that's where I think we're in a bad scope when we start talking about that. And we use the language and we, you know, going back to why we do this, you know, we're looking for, you know, trying to find truth in things. And I think that definition, defamation and lying are not very good and they don't, they don't have a whole lot of intrinsic truth to representing what in reality is the system that we're talking about. I don't think, and the way we use them isn't putting us closer to reality and helping us make more informed decisions viewing the world through that perspective, I guess. So uh, that's why I think we should change the frame on it, I guess. So, And the thing is, it doesn't really matter what I think because for the same reason that defamation is actively or practically harmful, it's how many people believe it, and it's how many people act because of what they believe on it, and how they indoctrinate their children with that idea, and all that. You know, like I can, I could hold the truth, and if no one believes me, does it still does it matter on that level, the pragmatic societal level, where is which the realm that defamation plays in? Does it even matter? You know, so that's that's a conversation also for a different time is. You know, even if you found the truth, that's you've only done half the job. It's showing it to everybody else and then believing it too. So that's an interesting thing. But I think we've rambled on long enough about it, and I think we're kind of starting to reiterate ourselves, which tends to happen when you start you, you hit a dead end, and it's like, well, I don't know. But uh, maybe somebody in the audience can give us something new to think about. Maybe. I, I definitely think it'd be interesting because we're, we're both, I think, pretty dug in right now on what we believe. And I don't, I think because there's no real way to know on it, it's, we don't have any real reason to change our opinions. If you can't prove it right or wrong, then you don't have a reason to change. And maybe that's a topic for another time. When do you change your mind if you can't prove it right or wrong? Or should you even hold it as a belief if you can't, you know, prove it right or wrong? I, that's an interesting conversation to have as well. But that's also something for a different time. So... I guess whenever we re-listen to this, we need to jot down the three or four other topics that we uh, stumbled upon while we were talking about this, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, on a light note, um, just to poke fun at another uh, YouTube channel I like, um, uh, because of, uh, I don't know, it, those of you who are sharp-eared enough may have heard, um, we're, uh, we're, we're here at my house today, so please bear with any cat noises here in the background. Uh, <laughs> to poke fun at Paul Harrell, it's a really good YouTube channel. Um, 
something similar. So anyway, enough cutting up. You, you good? I'm good. All right. Philosophers. Philosophers.